Hello, and thank you for joining this virtual presentation of an event that has become a regular and welcome tradition at recent Ella Montgomery conferences, the Honoring Our Donors Reception. Normally, we would be hosting this event in the library building with suitable refreshment, but it's difficult to recreate that experience online. My last experience to serve drinks through the computer misfired horribly, so I would encourage you to pause this video now and pour yourself something suitable as we prepare to raise a glass to celebrate the generosity and vision of the donors who keep the Ella Montgomery Research Collections growing and thriving. Cheers. Because we have been so remarkably blessed by so many donors over so many years, the custom at the conference honoring our donors event is to focus just on the gifts received over the past couple of years, that is to say, since the last conference, and I'll continue that practice in this presentation. That said, I'm always delighted to discuss any and all parts of our Montgomery Research Collections. So if you have questions about something that you may have heard about in the past and that I, that I do not mention in today's talk, please don't hesitate to contact me. My coordinates are given on the closing slide. I would also note that we continue to make steady progress with putting our Montgomery Collections online at kindredspaces.ca. And everything I'm discussing today should be in Kindred Spaces by year's end. Indeed, as I proceed with this talk, I'll be highlighting some items that are already available on Kindred Spaces. I'll be proceeding chronologically in discussing the gifts received since June 2018. As it happens, this allows me to save a very, very special announcement for last. This also means that I am, rather meanly, forcing you to listen all the way through to get to the big reveal at the end, but I hope you'll find it worth the wait and the journey there an interesting one. So, to begin at the beginning, the glad cries of the June 2018 Montgomery Conference were still echoing in our ears when we heard from a gentleman in Ontario with an interesting book and an interesting story to go with it. Indeed, the story's more interesting than the book, since a 1934 Harrop edition Anne of Green Gables with a dinged-up dust cover is not in and of itself particularly remarkable. This particular copy, however, bears Montgomery's signature and has a treasured piece of family lore associated with it. Quote, the autograph from Ella Montgomery was obtained in Norval, Ontario by my two aunts, Gladys and Margaret Gollop. This must have been shortly before the author left Norval. The two ladies would have been staying across the street from the manse with their aunt, Belle Webster. I was told that my aunts took their book copy to the manse front door and shyly asked Montgomery for the autograph. It was graciously given. We are very grateful indeed to Margaret Gollop's nephew, Mr. John Hull, who kindly offered us the gift of this book and even took the trouble to hand deliver it to us in September of 2018. I did not share with Mr. Hull that Montgomery's Norval era journals had quite a few unflattering things to say on the Gollop clan and especially its patriarch, whom Montgomery refers to less than fondly as, quote, old Gollop, close quote. In this context, however, we can appreciate that Montgomery's treatment of the two shy young Gollop girls on her doorstep was especially gracious. September 2018 brought another very welcome Ontario visitor, namely Ella Montgomery Research Associate and the chief benefactor of our Montgomery Research Collections, Dr. Donna Jane Campbell. On this occasion, she brought with her yet another accrual to the already vast Ryrie Campbell Collection in this case, a handful of books from Montgomery's personal library. These books all bear Montgomery's signature, including two examples of the beloved cat icon. Two of the books also bear additional inscriptions, indicating their subsequent passage into others' possession. The Blower of Bubbles, with a Montgomery signature dated 1920, also bears in another hand the name of Mrs. E. C. Webb, dated Christmas 1924. This, of course, is Myrtle Neil ne Webb, Montgomery's cousin, dear friend, and co-owner with her husband, Ernest, of the Cavendish Farm property that became immortalized as Green Gables. This incredible adventure from a Montgomery, with a Montgomery signature dated 1930 has the annotation Cameron MacDonald, Toronto, Ontario, May 25th, 1942, and so was almost certainly among the items removed from Montgomery's Toronto home by her eldest son, Chester Cameron, following her death in April of 42. In addition to the inscriptions, these books are also a most welcome complement to earlier donations, notably from the heirs of Ella Montgomery and from Betsy Epperly, of books from Montgomery's personal library, 
since they provide fascinating insight into the great richness and variety of Montgomery's voracious reading. This gift includes three short story collections and two novels, representing various literary genres and styles, including Samuel Merwin's Orientalist epic Silk, A Legend, and the time-traveling science fiction of Armour Macmillan's This Incredible Adventure. In the spring of 2019, the Institute and the Library were pleased to welcome a distinguished Japanese visitor, Professor Yuko Katsura. Professor Katsura published one of the first scholarly appreciations of Montgomery's influence in Japan in the journal Canadian Children's Literature in 1984, and presented at the Ella Montgomery Institute's first international conference in 1994. Her other contributions to Montgomery scholarship include work as translator on authorized Japanese editions of the Selected Journals of Ella Montgomery and the Anne of Green Gables Cookbook, and the 2008 collection co-edited with Sumiko Shirai, World Classics We Would Like to Know More About, Volume 10, Anne of Green Gables. Professor Katsura so enjoyed her time visiting the Institute and the Library and the displays prepared to welcome her that she subsequently donated signed presentation copies of her works to the Montgomery collections here. As you can see, the date of her first visit was a most auspicious one on the Japanese calendar, May 1st, 2019, the first of the new era, Rewa. Attendees at the 2018 conference will likely recall the presentation and display by Carolyn Collins, a founding member of both the Minnesota Ella Montgomery Literary Society and the Friends of the Ella Montgomery Institute, on the remarkable project undertaken by herself and the late Christy Worcester to source original examples of the extraordinary array of printed matter contained in Montgomery scrapbooks. This work, inspired by Betsy Epperly's beautiful book on the scrapbooks, Imagining Anne, the Island Scrapbooks of Ellen Montgomery, has gathered scores of original periodical issues, catalogs, souvenir calendars, and so on, providing matchless insight into Montgomery's printed universe. As mentioned at the 2018 conference donor reception, we were most grateful for the generous decision by Carolyn and by Christie's daughters, Emily and Anne, to donate the scrapbook source material to our Montgomery research collections. Last July, we were pleased to see Carolyn back for another visit, and with her she brought further accruals to this collection, including a stunning child's flower catalog, seen at left here, two issues of Ladies Home Journal, and a massive bound volume of the Illustrated London News from the early mid-1890s, all of which were clipped by Montgomery in assembling her scrapbooks. Indeed, there were several issues of the Illustrated London News that Montgomery liked so well that she clipped multiple images from single pages to add to her scrapbook, as I've marked with the red stars here. And here's a further example of one thing leading happily and productively to another. Some of you will recall that in July of 2017, the Library and the LMMI hosted a showcase featuring a virtual reality program commissioned by the Institute to demonstrate the profound impact the 1883 wreck of the famous sailing vessel Marco Polo of Cavendish had had on, Ellen, on young Ellen Montgomery. Among the displays prepared by the library to accompany this showcase was a reproduction, courtesy of our friends at the PEI Public Archives, of a 1928 letter by Montgomery offering a vivid recounting of the shipwreck and highlighting her own artifacts of the Marco Polo, including a tanker, tankard and a large stoneware platter. In the letter, Montgomery noted that she had inherited these from her grandmother and that they were now, quote, among my most treasured relics, close quote. The tankard is now lost to history, but the platter sounded very familiar to one of the visitors to the virtual reality experience, Montgomery's granddaughter-in-law, Vivian MacDonald. This treasured relic had passed down to her late husband, Montgomery's grandson Rod, and had in turn passed to her daughter, Allison Alley Hodge. Mrs. MacDonald was so struck by this evidence of the importance of the platter to the Montgomery legacy that she arranged with her daughter to have it donated here. The occasion of the formal donation last August was made even more auspicious by its taking place alongside a visit from the Institute's international patron, Her Imperial Highness Princess Takamado of Japan. In a ceremony hosted in the library to mark the 15th anniversary of Her Highness's first visit to UPEI, she graciously accepted the gift of the platter on the Institute's behalf. Surely there could have been no better hands in which to place it. Nor was this the only gift presented to the Institute care of Her Imperial Highness on this occasion. 
on August, August Day, if you will. Also in attendance were the granddaughters of Hanoku Moroka, the pioneering Japanese translator of Anne of Green Gables, and thus the founder of Montgomery's incredible cultural legacy in Japan. Eri and Mi Maroka gifted a number of Japanese language books to the Institute, including new translations of two Montgomery novels and several books inspired by their grandmother's life and work, including Eri's biography of her grandmother, Anne's Cradle. And the gift giving didn't end there. Although protocol and scheduling considerations precluded a formal presentation from Her Imperial Highness at the August ceremony, she did generously leave us with these books, including two of her award-winning titles for children and two stunning photographic catalogs of the world-famous collections of Netsuke donated by Her Imperial Highness and her late husband, Prince Takamado, to the Tokyo National Museum. Netsuke were originally utilitarian objects, used to secure items such as pipes, tobacco, money, seals, or medicines to the cord, or obi, worn with traditional Japanese kimonos. Over time, however, these carved toggles evolved into exquisitely crafted works of art, and the prince and princess became the leading collectors of and experts on Netsuke. Montgomery would doubtless be gratified to know that the institute bearing her name has an international patron able to appreciate and to exercise the skill and love of beauty seen here. As 2019 drew to a close, the library and the Institute were delighted to receive a further accrual to the Ryrie Campbell collection in the form of a gift from Dr. Donna Jane Campbell of approximately 60 periodical pieces, mostly Canadian but also some American, containing reviews of Montgomery's work and biographical profiles from her lifetime, as well as posthumous articles on her legacy and impact. Aside from a few clippings and photographs, this gift consisted mainly of original periodical issues, mostly in very good to excellent condition, thanks to Dr. Campbell's care and skill in building and managing her collections. As it happens, the library had been able, thanks to generous monetary support from Dr. Campbell, to hire a graduate student intern, recent library school graduate Megan Kirkland, in the fall of 2019 to expand the content available through Kindred Spaces. As a result, I am very happy to report that digital copies of these recently donated periodical pieces are all available via Kindred Spaces. The material dates mainly from 1908 through to the early 1990s, and so offers insight into how Montgomery and her work were viewed both during her lifetime and in the decades since. Limitations of time and space do not allow me to do anything like proper justice to the scale and scope of this collection here. But one thread that stood out for me was the considerable popular fascination not just with Montgomery's work, but also with Montgomery herself. And I show kindredspaces.ca screenshots here of just a few examples, including, as seen at right, a 1951 Maclean's color profile on Lucy of Green Gables, a two-part 1928 feature in Chatelaine on, quote, the best-known woman on Prince Edward Island, close quote, and a prominently placed feature article from an October 1913 issue of the Weekly Globe, Ellen Montgomery, story writer. One sometimes hears it bruited about that Montgomery's star dimmed somewhat between the early sensation of Green Gables and the explosion of popular and scholarly interest in the 1980s. But items like these offer value, valuable and informative insight on Montgomery's sustained impact over the past century plus. One of the most recent gifts to the Montgomery collections here came about through the good offices of Montgomery, Ella Montgomery scholar and longtime boon companion to the LMMI, Dr. Laura Robinson, whose distinguished academic career has continued with her appointment just last year as Dean of Arts at Acadia. In communication a few months ago with the family of a former Acadia professor, Dr. Robinson learned of a handwritten poem paying tribute to Montgomery, penned at the time of Montgomery's death. It transpired that the poem was conceived by Mrs. Joan Hartman, then resident of Georgetown, upon learning of Montgomery's passing in April of 1942, but several years elapsed before she shared it with a wider audience, sending it to the Charlottetown Guardian. The poem was printed in the Guardian issue of May 10, 1945, just a day after the island learned the news of victory in Europe, VE Day, a coincidence which likely would have pleased Montgomery. As our time marches on, I will not share the whole poem here. 
The handwritten copy will be on Kindred Spaces presently, and the Guardian piece is online now in our islandnewspapers.ca collection. But you'll indulge me if I quote the closing verse. The tossing gulls that swirl against the wind's great beat, and singing birds whose sweet notes charm the lanes, are hushed to hear above their song in cadence sweet, her singing spirits now immortal strains. This certainly suggests that Montgomery would have considered Mrs. Hartman, Nee Tyler, she later remarried and took the last name Easton, a kindred spirit. Indeed, the admiring biographical sketch provided by the donor of this item, the poet's niece, Jill Blakeney, notes that her Aunt Joan was a hard-working woman caught in a difficult marriage to a Protestant clergyman, Anglican in this case, who, quote, found comfort in books and classical music and writing poetry and took solace in PEI's natural beauty." Close quote. And now we come to the grand finale of this presentation. Since you've hung in there so patiently so long, I will not delay further, except to say that those in the library and the LMMI who have been fortunate enough to be involved with this donation over the past several months are, like Elizabeth and Wendy Poplars, flushed the divinest rosy red with the excitement of it. I am honored and delighted to announce that Donna Jane Campbell has purchased and presented to the LMMI a previously unknown collection from the family papers of George Boyd Macmillan of Aloha, Scotland. The Mr. Macmillan famous to the Montgomery community, of course, as Montgomery's longtime correspondent, my dear Mr. M. The collection was purchased from G.B. Macmillan descendant, Mr. Duncan Macmillan of Scotland. It includes such fascinating items as a photo printed of Mr. Macmillan and another photo print of the Montgomery family, quote, the Mac family on the way to Muskoka, and you see them standing by the car there at the lower left, a signed typescript poem from Montgomery, New Year Wishes, published elsewhere, as I wish you, and signed presentation copies of publications containing Montgomery's writings, including the verse and reverse booklet of the Toronto Women's Press Club, and the 1939 Spirit of Canada. This last work, a handsomely illustrated book issued to commemorate that year's royal visit, included a chapter on each province, including a tribute to Prince Edward Island from Montgomery. You'll note that the copy in this gift includes the original presentation envelope with labels in Montgomery's own handwriting. The real highlight of this gift, however, is an album containing more than 70 postcards from Ellen Montgomery to Macmillan, dating from the time of their earliest correspondence in 1903 through to Montgomery's move to Toronto in 1935, though the bulk of the cards date from 1903 to about 1917. Most of the postcards are in very good condition and clearly legible, making allowances for Montgomery's notoriously tricky handwriting, of course. Although some of the cards are confined to commonplace chit-chat about the weather and gardening, many more offer exciting and intriguing snapshots of epical developments in Montgomery's life and career. In the April 1907 card at Left, for example, she reports, quote, just received today that I have had a book manuscript accepted by a prominent American publishing firm, close quote. The rare strikeout in her handwriting and the upside-down stamp perhaps betray her excitement that Anne of Green Gables has finally found a publisher. It is, however, indicative of the relaxed and unpretentious tone of this postcard correspondence that Montgomery also took time to jot a note, quote, typical winter scene in the strait, alongside the front photo of a PEI ferry, the long-suffering Stanley, bashing its way through the ice. We also see a playful tone in the card at right from the following year, July of 1908 to be exact. I'm sending a copy of the underlying the book today. Hope you'll like it, but don't say you do if you don't. Your letter received lately will answer underlined sooner than you deserve." Close quote. As the years pass, of course, the pressures of life mount. In the postcard at left from November of 1915, quote, we have a new baby boy here born October 7th. And this, of course, refers to Stuart, who was born on October 7th, 1915, returning to, quote, sorry to learn you are not very well. We are all feeling the dreadful strain of the war, close quote. In the postcard at right, we also see Montgomery's fondness for illusion in play, with the, quote, if we live in deeds, not years, in feelings, not in figures on a dial, which is drawn from Philip James Bailey's epic poem Festus, 
Montgomery's conclusion to her note captures her ongoing preoccupation with the Great War. Quote, I can never forget the agony of the first reports of the naval battle, close quote. Because it was enclosed in a larger packet, this card is undated and has no postmark, but there's a fair chance that the naval battle referred to is the Battle of Jutland, by far the most high-profile naval encounter of the First World War, which raged from May 31st to June 1st of 1916. But this is just one of scores of intriguing avenues for further investigation and discovery that these cards will surely open. Digital imaging of this gift for online presentation on kindredspaces.ca has unfortunately been delayed by the closure of the library building, including our digitization lab. But we're hopeful that this will begin soon as the UPEI campus gradually reopens. As an interim measure, I was able to share iPhone images of the postcards with Betsy Epperly and Mary Beth Cabert. And we can all be grateful for the generous and uniquely skilled assistance they are offering with transcriptions of Montgomery's handwritten messages. And these will be shared on Kindred Spaces along with images of the cards themselves. As you have likely gathered by this point, I could talk about all of these gifts, and especially this treasure trove of postcards, all day. But I know there is lots of other great content on this online forum for you to check out. So out of consideration for your time and mine, I will conclude for now. I very much look forward to hearing your questions and comments about anything I've mentioned or haven't in this presentation. And of course, leads on further donations are always welcome. Right now, I am on a hybrid schedule, working part-time in the office and part-time at home. The library building remains closed to visitors, alas, until further notice, but I will be happy to hear from you via email or telephone until the glad day comes when we can meet again in person. To you all, and most especially to our donors, a thousand times, thank you. Your curiosity and generosity are the blood in our veins, keeping alive the singing strains of Montgomery's immortal spirit.